Hello there! In this video, or actually in these two videos, we're going to ask the question, what would have happened if the galaxy had actually found out that Vader was Anakin Skywalker soon after the events of Revenge of the Sith? This is a suggestion from one of you guys, so if you've got a suggestion of your own, leave it in the comments and maybe it'll get made. I've actually tried to incorporate two of your suggestions into, well, it was originally one video, but the video ended up being so long that it's now two videos. But anyway, into one storyline. So I hope it works, let me know if you think it works, but without further ado, let's go on with the video. We pick up soon after episode 3. In the Vader comics by Charles Soule, which is a great set of comics if you've not read them by the way, we see Vader meet the newly named Grand Inquisitor in the former Jedi Temple on Coruscant. The Grand Inquisitor is looking in the archives for information that he wasn't allowed to access when he was a Jedi. We see that the Grand Inquisitor and Vader have a fight until Sidious formally introduces the two, explaining who the Inquisitors actually are to Vader. After these scenes in the comics, the Grand Inquisitor would return to the temple in order to continue his search, he would be sitting at the terminal to a holo projector when something would catch his eye. There would be some recent files in the holo recordings of the temple, which would be restricted despite Sidious promising the Grand Inquisitor complete access to all the knowledge in the temple. The Grand Inquisitor would assume that due to these files being recent, they'd just been overlooked, but what if they were important? The restriction didn't really matter anyway, as in around a standard hour's time, after a short trip to pick up a droid to slice into the system, the Grand Inquisitor would have access to the files. He would begin to watch hollow recordings of the very recent storming of the Jedi Temple, and after a few minutes of just watching hundreds of clones gun down his former associates, he would open another file of Jedi being killed, except this time it was not by clones but instead by another Jedi, Anakin Skywalker. He would watch as the former poster boy Jedi, the Republic hero, slaughtered anyone in his path, and just as he would begin to wonder whether perhaps this Darth Vader he just fought had some connection to the fallen Jedi he was watching, his questions would be answered, as he watched Anakin kneel in front of Sidious, and hear Sidious call the former Jedi Darth Vader, the Sith he'd just fought. After a moment of realising that in answering his previous question the holo recording had presented many more, he would ask himself what to do with this newly acquired information. After some thought he would decide that since he didn't really know Vader and certainly didn't trust him, it couldn't hurt to possess some information against the Sith as he clearly didn't want his identity being known by the galaxy, or else he wouldn't have restricted the information in the first place. So the Grand Inquisitor would quickly download the recordings onto a data rod and return to the other Inquisitors on Coruscant. Over the next few weeks, the Inquisitors would train and hunt Jedi who had evaded the Purge, but after a while the Grand Inquisitor would begin to wonder what else was happening, and it would dawn on him that the Inquisitors were just tools, weapons. He had gone from an order which refused to tell him what he wanted to know, to an empire that refused to tell him anything anything other than the location of his next victim. This fact would begin to eat away at the Grand Inquisitor. It would be made all the more worse knowing that Vader seemed to know far more than him, as when he would inquire about something to Vader, he would be told that it just wasn't his concern. The Grand Inquisitor would eventually become so infuriated by this, and Vader specifically, that he would decide that his only course of action was to try and take Vader's place. He would, however, know that he wasn't capable of besting the Sith in combat, so the only weapon he possessed was this knowledge that Vader Vader, this figure, this name which carried more fear than a fleet of Star Destroyers, was actually a former hero of the Republic, Anakin Skywalker. The Grand Inquisitor would admittedly not be entirely sure what power this fact actually had, but even if it just embarrassed the Sith for a while, it would be worth it just to see Vader's reaction. And so the Grand Inquisitor would form a plan. The next time he returned from a mission, he would take a short detour to the Imperial Holonet News Building on Coruscant, with a few modified infiltrator demolition droids, like the ones from the Clone Wars, which bombed the power distribution grid. He would escort the droids in, because although he may not know much about the inner workings of the Empire, being a scary Imperial with a lightsaber did grant him access to most places. He would give excuses that they were just maintenance droids. Once they were past any form of security, he would return to the other Inquisitors while the droids began their work. First, they would infiltrate the main server room, and utilising the modification to the model we see in the Clone Wars, they would splice into the default no signal broadcast, so that it would play messages that informed people of Vader's identity, along with some of the hollow recording clips from the data rod that the Grand Inquisitor had, instead of the default no broadcast at this time message that would normally be played in the event that there was no broadcast at this time. So that when the droids did the demolition part of the job, the no signal message would be replaced by this information that Vader was in fact Anakin Skywalker. And so, after doing the infiltrating part of the job, the droids 
would proceed to do the demolition part of the job, destroying the Imperial Holonet news building along with any evidence of the Grand Inquisitor's involvement, and just as planned, the broadcast would default not to its no signal output, but rather to the truth of Vader's identity. Admittedly, this output would be silenced after mere moments of engineers working to silence it, but by then half the galaxy would know that the Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker was in fact Darth Vader, and in days, the other half of the galaxy would also know. Initially, this would appear to have the apparent desired effect for the Grand Inquisitor. Vader would seem to cut himself off from everything, and what the Grand Inquisitor would assume was shame or fear or embarrassment, until one day, a few standard weeks later, after the broadcast, the Inquisitors would be training when suddenly each of them would stop, as they would sense the presence of pure rage, anger, hatred. Each of the Inquisitors would know the dark side well, but they would never have experienced it like this. Vader would walk into the room and stand for a moment before telling them that they were supposed to be training, or did they need a more stimulating challenge? He would then proceed to choke each of them with the force and walk out, leaving the Inquisitors alive, just. So what effect would this news of Vader's identity actually have on the galaxy? Well, during the few weeks of apparent absence, Vader would have become even more angry. He would meditate on both the obvious attempt to slander him, but also on the fact that he could no longer reject his past. He would focus his efforts on not giving in to sadness for loss, but rather anger, and after these few weeks, would be successfully even further immersed into the dark side, driven by rage. However, he would also become even less trusting of everyone, which would cause him to demand even more loyalty of his fellow Imperials, and he would become even more cruel and oppressive, especially to high-ranking Imperials, as those were the people that he had to deal with. This in turn would cause Imperial regime to become even stricter and more oppressive across the galaxy, for both civilians and those within the Empire, as these high-ranking Imperials would need to demonstrate more loyalty to the Empire and Vader from both themselves, but also from the sectors of the galaxy that they were in some position of power over. Some governors would struggle to demonstrate such loyalty, whilst others like Tarkin would revel at the opportunity to take far more control of their sectors. So on Tatooine and other Outer Rim worlds, previously controlled by gangs and cartels, the Imperials would deploy heightened Imperial presence, effectively removing the Huts and other criminal empires from the galaxy. This, however, would give need for a larger military, so the Empire would begin to conscript about 20% of humans between the ages of, we'll say, 20 and 35 at random, putting them through tests to determine where they would be best able to serve. They would only do this on planets, however, with no presence in the Imperial Senate, so in many Outer Rim territories, including Tatooine, they would do this to avoid political resistance to the conscription. Both the increase in Imperial presence and the potential of military conscription on Tatooine would be of major concern for both the Lazars and Obi-Wan, as the potential discovery of Luke as the son of Vader would be made all the more likely, especially considering the revelation to the galaxy of Vader being Anakin. Owen and Beru, however, would decide that it would just draw more attention if they fled the planet than if they just laid low for a while. So, after a tense discussion with Obi-Wan, because we see that Owen and Obi-Wan don't get on in the comics, they would agree that the only immediate course of action would be for Luke to be raised as planned on Tatooine, except this time as the adopted son of Owen and Beru, giving him the last name Lars, and then further action could be taken when Luke was older and not a baby. Elsewhere in the galaxy, Ahsoka would have just made connections with the fledgling Rebel Alliance via Bail Organa, like we see in the Ahsoka novel, when she would hear of Anakin's fate. Ahsoka would remember what Maul had said on Mandalore, the way he had kind of warned her about this corruption of Anakin. He hadn't exactly been very trustworthy, and hadn't actually wanted to help Anakin, but Ahsoka wouldn't help but feel as though she could have, should have, at least done something more, contacted Master Kenobi, or even Anakin himself. And after a few days of grief, Ahsoka would decide that it was her duty to Anakin and to the galaxy as a whole to confront her former master. She would know that she couldn't defeat him, so her only hope was to bring him back. It was her duty to set things right, she couldn't live with the knowledge that she had, in her mind, failed the galaxy and her brother. She would, from the ship provided to her by Bail, call him, Bail that is, not Vader, and tell him that she had something important to attend to, and before she could continue he would interrupt her and just say that he knew and understood completely. He would continue by saying that he may, however, have heard from a certain former clone captain who had reached out to Bail after the news of Vader's identity became known, offering to help the fledgling rebellion in some way. Bail wouldn't mention the fact that Rex had clearly been racked with grief after the loss of his purpose, his brothers, and now Anakin, and was clearly just looking for some hope in the galaxy which seemed to be taking everything from him. And so, after thanking Bail for his help, Ahsoka would travel to the coordinates the Senator had provided and would soon be 
reunited with a clearly desperate Captain Rex. The two would begin to talk and after many standard days of deliberation, would finally be ready to start the rather difficult task of saving Anakin Skywalker. And so, for a while, the galaxy would know some form of peace. The Empire would rule with an even tighter grip than in the normal timeline, but overall the galactic-wide story would basically happen like we see between episodes 3 and 4. The rebellion would grow much like it does in the actual story, as although the Empire was more oppressive and demanded an even greater level of compliance, this cruelty would also cause more people to want to do something to overthrow the tyranny, so the rebellion would end up being a similar size to normal, due to the increased imperial oppression both positively and negatively impacting the growth of the alliance. However, within the Empire, although there would be more loyalty from high-ranking Imperials, the lower ranks who didn't interact with Vader would feel far less loyalty as many of them would be conscripts, and all of them would live in constant fear that if a superior officer wanted to prove their loyalty to Vader and the Empire, they would be punished for potentially no reason. And so, although from outside, the Empire would seem unstoppable and unwavering, order within the Empire itself would be heavily reliant on fear and oppression over true loyalty, effectively meaning that the only thing stopping uprising within the Empire was fear, for the highest ranking Imperials fear of Vader, and for those who were less senior, fear of those who were more senior. On Tatooine, things would go largely as they do in the canon timeline. Luke Lars would grow up on a moisture farm with his parents, Owen and Beru. The Empire would have more of a presence on the planet, but due to some convenient mind tricks when needed, Luke would largely grow up like he does normally, dreaming of flying and unaware that the most feared person in the galaxy was his biological father. Meanwhile, Ahsoka and Rex would spend years, standard years that is, tracking Anakin, learning more about him and his movements, hoping for some indication that there was still light in him, and maybe some way of getting that light to resurface in the unlikely event that they could confront him without the presence of half the Imperial military also being there. The two of them would also provide intelligence to the Rebellion, effectively acting as Rebellion spies who followed Vader specifically, but obviously from enough distance not to be noticed. Just like in the actual story, the Empire would rule largely unopposed for 19 standard years, except this time, the Outer Rim and systems previously controlled by criminals would instead have true Imperial rule. And after these 19 years, the events of Rogue One would happen like they do in the canon timeline. Now before this, the events of Solo would still happen, due to Crimson Dawn, specifically Maul, being rather difficult for the Empire to overpower. So Han would meet Chewie and end up with the Falcon. But when the two travelled to Tatooine, like we see them plan to do at the end of Solo, they would find that the Hutt Empire had been overthrown by the Empire Empire. And unfortunately for the two smugglers, they would end up being forced to become freighters for the Empire, in an attempt from the Empire to both control smuggling and also gain a lot of very cheap labour, only just above slavery. Han and Chewie, because they'd been captured or employed on Tatooine, would primarily be based on Tatooine, and so therefore, although some of the circumstances would be different, the events of A New Hope would actually happen as normal, as with the incentive of enough credits, Obi-Wan would be able to convince Han and Chewie to risk punishment from the Empire and provide passage to the Alderaan system, and the traditional story of A New Hope would continue from there. And just like we see in A New Hope, the Rebellion would attack the Death Star and manage to destroy it. This would be a massive blow to the Empire, obviously it had lost its greatest technological threat, but even more so, a lot of Imperial High Command would also be lost. The chain of fear would be broken as many junior Imperial officers who had never met Vader would see their oppressors gone in the destruction of the Death Star. And so troopers and junior officers would begin to speak openly with one another about the flaws of the Empire, with no one to quell this insubordination. And so, in only a very short time after the events of Episode 4, multiple sectors of the Empire would see the newly appointed governors actually encouraging insurrection against the larger Empire. This would mostly happen in sectors that use conscription, as many Imperials would believe the Empire itself to be in need of new leadership. Slowly, these insurrections would grow and unify into a united revolution. And that's where we'll finish this video, part one of the two-part story. Like I said at the start of this video, it was actually only supposed to be one part, it was only supposed to be one video, but the video ended up becoming so long that I had to cut it in half. So the other half of the video is already recorded, it's already edited, it's ready to come out, so it'll be coming out really, really soon. So keep an eye out for that. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, let me know what you think should happen following this before the next video comes out. And that's about it. Thanks for watching. Bye!